Hello. We are together today at a rare moment, a pause between two ages, caught between the future and the past. A steady force has faded and what's coming next is yet to reveal itself in full. Today we'll hear from three former Prime Ministers for whom Queen Elizabeth was a trusted confidant, maybe even a friend. But as one era closes, another opens. A new king, and don't forget, a new Prime Minister too. Change comes gradually, then suddenly after all. A fanfare. A transfer. From queen to king, from mother to son. Sadness and memory. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. The clamour stills. And a new sound comes. God save our gracious King, God save our The end of one era. The journey to the next begun. I've been speaking to David Cameron, Theresa May and Gordon Brown. And what was the view of the Queen from across the pond? We'll hear from JFK's daughter, now Ambassador Caroline Kennedy, who played with the Royals as a girl. And with me for this whole programme today, King Charles' close friend and former Conservative MP, Nicholas Soames, Alison Phillips, the editor of the Daily Mirror, and Baroness Amos, the diplomat and Labour peer. Welcome to you all. Now, good morning. So much has changed in a week and there is so much to come. I want to show you straight away what's happening at Balmoral right now, from where in an hour the coffin of Her Majesty the Queen will begin its journey to London, starting with the long six hour drive from the castle to Edinburgh and the palace of Holyrood House, a journey that will be recorded and shown forever. And we'll bring that to you here on the BBC throughout the day with a special programme. And just as today's newspapers are marking this moment, it feels like one of those days when you want to buy one of those editions and maybe store it away for the rest of your life. Let's take a look at some historic front pages. A beautiful image of the Queen, Her Late Majesty, there on the front of the Sunday Times. Several of the newspapers, perhaps not surprisingly, picking out those surprise images yesterday of the next generation. Harry and Meghan appearing by surprise at Windsor Castle with the Prince and Princess of Wales. Extraordinary front pages there. Welcome to all of you here this morning. Um, Nicholas Soames, what stands out for you from the papers this morning? Well, I think, Laura, the very powerful imagery of the late Queen. I think these newspapers have carried the most wonderful portraits of her mm. through her reign in the last two days. And I'm particularly struck, there's a beautiful one in the Sunday Times of the Queen dressed in the state dress of the Order of the Thistle, taken actually at Balmoral against the Highland background. It's a very moving picture and kind of signifies her love of Scotland, where she sadly died. Is but I think they are very powerful, these images. And record such an extraordinary and long life. Um, Alison Phillips, what did you take away from this morning? I mean, there's so much to choose from, isn't there? There, <clears throat> there really is, but I thought the picture of the family coming out at the gates of Balmoral yesterday was particularly poignant because, although obviously down in London at that point, there was mm. the, um, the ceremony of the accession, at the same time, we have to remember that there is a family in grief. It's a mm. very personal thing. And I think her granddaughters, Beatrice, Eugenie and Zara, all moved to tears. And mm. um, Sophie Wessex, who she had a very close relationship, looked terribly upset. And mm -hmm. I think... We that can amidst, see her there at Barbara. Yeah, Barbara's and I think amidst Louise. all, all the, the, the ceremony and, and, the, and the idea that the whole country really wants to join in this, this point of mourning, we have to remember it's a, a very personal family event as well. Baroness Amos, what struck you? Really the crowds. Um, and I was there yesterday, you actually, outside Buckingham Palace, uh, yeah. Buckingham Palace and uh, people from across the world, people from across Britain, the children, and it's all about continuity and change. It's wanting to res pay their respects to the late Queen, but also wanting to welcome our new King. And there are some marvellous uh, 
pictures in the newspapers. But St. James's Palace, which um, I was there for the Accession Council, mm -hmm. I saw people uh, there as well. People just materialised out of nowhere. It was so hard to get through, mm. but the patience that people uh, were showing. I think it's absolutely extraordinary. I was there yesterday too at the mall and it was absolutely packed but there was many smiles along with the sadness mm. and it did feel people were genuinely from every generation, every background coming together and that happened so rarely. But one of the other things that was so striking yesterday was the surprise appearance of Harry and Meghan alongside Prince and Princess of Wales at Windsor Castle. Nicholas Holmes, I know you know the royal family well. They've obviously had a terrible agony over the fractured relationship. What did you think when you saw those images yesterday? Well, I thought it was a very powerful picture. And, um, you know, as you said, Laura, um, grief in a family brings people together. And I think it's worth remembering that the royal family, I mean, it's only 18 months ago that Prince Philip died, mm. and now the Queen has died, and they, I think, must be, you know, stricken with grief, and I, I think um, Alison is quite right. I mean, it was very, very touching to see the rest of the family outside mm -hmm. the gates of Armour, obviously deeply moved by the tributes. And I always think it's so striking at moments of grief how the human face is so dignified in the face of grief. And you looked at those crowds in Biden Bay, they were... It was this mixture of grief and and being there together, corporate and, sense of being together. Well, it's interesting you say a, a, a corporate sense and maybe also a deliberate sense from the royals, do you think, to show that unity yesterday where there has, we know, been such despair and unhappiness between the two brothers? Well, I, whatever the reason for it, I think all of us can be very pleased to see it. And uh, I thought that the king in his address made very clear of his great love and affection for uh, Prince Harry and Meghan and, and that was the outward and visible sign of that happening and I think that's very good news. Alison, do you I think, think the difficult thing here, Laura, is that this is both really personal and it's also public. Mm -hmm. We've all, all been through these moments with our families where we've had, you know, tragic loss, the pain, uh, the grief uh, and there is a coming together. There is a putting, to, putting aside of differences at that moment in time. Of course, we all hope that this will continue, but I think it was something that uh, we were all very, very pleased to see yesterday. Alison, briefly. Yes, I think um, it, it, I think it, the word came from um, Prince Will uh, uh, the Prince, Prince of Wales. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that, that this was a show of unity, and let's hope that it's not just a show. There mm -hmm. is actually a sense of unity. Clearly, a very, very big gesture. Yes. that took place yesterday that we all witnessed and clearly really delighted the crowds to see them yeah. coming out together. Now, thank you all very much from now. Shortly, we'll be uh, touching on some other stories making the news this morning as well. But with power transferred, one of the most important relationships the king will have is with his prime minister. Liz Truss will be the first to undertake the weekly ritual of the audience with him, as it's properly known. And in the last couple of days, I've spent some time with three people who've done the job three people who were in the room yesterday when King Charles formally took the throne. Here are David Cameron, Theresa May and Gordon Brown on the kind of king that Charles might be. Well, it was a huge privilege to be there because this, this event has happened in one form or another since Anglo-Saxon times. So you felt you were part of uh, an extraordinary historical event. Everybody saw at the Accession Council all the former prime ministers, one of the most exclusive clubs in the world, having the odd whisper and word to each other. What were you talking about? Well, the, the number of ex-prime ministers is growing. Um, I said to Boris, it's the, it's the club that no one wants to join and you never get to leave. Um, but uh, there, there's a, always a good uh, sort of camaraderie amongst us. It's, it's interesting because often they were your principal political opponent. I was up against Tony Blair and then Gordon Brown. And, and now when we meet at these things, it's, it's much more talk about how the children or grandchildren and, um, uh, and uh, sort of discussion of those sorts of things um, rather, than, uh, rather than anything more, more profound. So that was mostly what the, the banter was about, I think, when we were chatting and welcoming in Boris, our newest member. <laughs> Did he look happy to be welcomed to that club? Well, he, he, was, he, was, he, was looking, he was looking happy. So I don't know if he was happy to join the club, but he was looking happy. Of course, one of the great things of our constitution is 
as soon as one monarch passes, another monarch accedes to the throne. So is that continuation of somebody who is there, who will get to know the issues, who will have experience, and of course King Charles, as Prince Charles, has been, if you like, on, you know, in waiting for, and, and for this uh, role. I uh, had audiences with Prince Charles when Queen Elizabeth II was still on the throne because he wanted to start thinking about how to conduct those audiences. And from what I saw, he, he will be brilliant at that job, brilliant at listening, brilliant at asking questions, um, giving wise advice and sage counsel. I mean, this has probably been the longest apprenticeship in history. And uh, he knows so much about so many subjects. And like his mother, he is a superb diplomat. I saw him in action at Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings. And he knows every leader personally. He interacts with them brilliantly. The soft power that the British monarch brings to help a prime minister and a government with all those international relations, it was obviously outstanding under Queen Elizabeth II. I think you'll see that Charles III uh, will be a very worthy successor in that regard. What's he like? I mean, your paths will have crossed, and as you said yourself, he's somebody who has been in public life for many decades before acceding the throne. What's he like? He's a very thoughtful individual, um, but has his mother's sense of fun as well. A nice person, and I think uh, I think you would enjoy uh, meet, meeting him, and I think you would enjoy meeting him and uh, the Queen Consort uh, Camilla. But obviously, this is a completely different job from being uh, uh, the heir apparent and from being the prin prin Prince of Wales. And I think uh, quickly he'll understand that he has responsibilities right across the world. Well, the first thing I'd say is he's um, extremely intelligent and charming. My my <laughs> wife always said when you know we had to go to one of those uh, banquets or dinners or big meetings she always said I hope I'm sitting next to Prince Charles he's the best person to sit next to he's the most charming company there's no one who is uh, better at putting at your ease and more charming companion to talk to and that's her words um, so he's immensely charming he's highly intelligent you know while it is incredibly sad that we're mourning the loss of our a loss of our greatest monarch. Um, I think the constitutional monarchy is in great hands. When he was still Prince of Wales, though, he, he did make representations on many different causes. Did he ever write you any of those famous letters that he did as Prince of <laughs> Wales, pushing for various of his issues? Well, I've, of course, and, and I had many conversations with Prince Charles. I, and, you know, I do respect his, his views on the environment. He was, he's been a leader in this. But I think what he was saying uh, when he spoke uh, to the country on Friday was that he was going to set aside uh, his charities and his interests in favour of concentrating, you know, 100% on, on the duties of the monarch. And I think that will involve a huge amount of, uh, of travelling. And I think that will involve travelling not just in Britain, but, uh, but across the world. And I think we've got to understand that that is a good thing for Britain, that we have a monarch that is prepared uh, to be outward looking, prepared to, to speak to countries right across the world. I never felt he tried to influence uh, me improperly in any way. I think that the heir to the throne has a perfect right to have an interest in issues like the environment, like preserving wildlife, uh, like his, his uh, interest in the built environment. In fact, many of the causes he took up um, back in the you know, 60s and 70s might have looked you know, rather fringe, he picked his subjects superbly, became an expert in things like climate change and the environment long before politicians were talking about them. And I think his, his pursuit of them was entirely justified. I think it's entirely right that the heir to the throne can discuss things with politicians and write them letters and, and all the rest of it. Um, why not? And in fact, I don't, uh, I, I don't see why there should be um, any public concern about that. In fact, I, my view was that those letters should remain private. And do you think that the monarchy will need to adapt? I think what uh, Prince Charles has al already indicated is that the monarchy is going to be smaller. Uh, it's going to be uh, more like a Scandinavian monarchy in future, I think, uh, but not in a bad way, in the sense that uh, more informal. I think he stopped as he entered Buckingham Palace and talked to people in the crowd, and that was a sim signal he was sending, uh, that he wanted people to feel he was approachable and he was not uh, going to... Uh, be, um, uh, you know, absent from the public or alternatively be unapproachable.
if you look at the monarchy it and, and the royal family, they have been steadily evolving a different approach, a different way of doing things over time. And I'm sure that King Charles will take that, continue to take that forward. And of course, he is a different person um, and uh, he may want to you know, change things in some ways. But I think critically, as the Queen did, any change in the way things are done would be done gradually and very carefully. And beyond that visibility, I suppose, in our communities, in our towns, villages and cities, what do you think the public, I suppose, have the right to expect from the new king? Well, I think they, they will expect that sense of continuity, but also that sense of recognising that the world is changing, has been changing, continues to change. And so a willingness to evolve um, a, a alongside that. And I think what they will hope and what they will get is that deep interest in people which Her Majesty had. And King Charles, I believe, has that too. A deep concern for people and wanting to understand people's interests, people's circumstances, pe com different communities around the country. And translating that, actually, into um, the role that he has as a monarch. I think the most important thing they have a right to expect is service and duty. That is what Queen Elizabeth II absolutely personified. She was good to her word of what she said as a young princess, age 25 in South Africa. My life, be it long or short, will be dedicated to serving you. But it's more than that, because I think her brilliance was that it was not just service and duty. It was a profound understanding of the role, of the institution, of the history, but above all, a profound understanding of the British people, of the people she was giving that service and duty to. And I think it was because she had that understanding that she was so able to reign so brilliantly for so long and to adapt, often very subtly, to the needs of a changing country. Service, duty and understanding. And he's got all those things. Well, we hear more of the Prime Minister's memories and recollections of the Queen a bit later in the programme. But, Sir Nicholas, what kind of king do you think Charles will be? You're one of the few people in the country who know him very well. Well, I, I think that he is in an extraordinary position because he's kind of a link with the past and to the future. Mm -hmm. He has a profound, I think David Cameron put it very well, he has a profound understanding of people. The work of the Prince's Trust that he's done has helped over a I mean, million people. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of thousands of people put into new jobs. I think his understanding of what goes on on the ground in this country is a great deal more thorough than people would even understand possibly. And therefore, and his manner, his whole manner is sympathetic, understanding and empathy. And I think we saw that with the crowd outside Buckingham Palace yesterday. Well, it's interesting, Alison, that he's chosen already twice to go on a walkabout, mm. to speak to the crowds. Even the first time he arrived back at Buckingham Palace, straight out of the car to go and greet people. And yet, over the years, he has sometimes seemed, compared to his mother, a, a more remote figure, whereas we know that um, you know, the, the Queen was held in such affection. How do you think he'll make that transition? You know, we can see him there outside Clara's house last night, smiling, joking, even with the crowd and accepting condolence. Well, I, I think this is interesting as well, of course, because his mother, in her final decade, really, was unable to do the foreign tours as much, and she, was, she wasn't she was able to go out and meet people as much, obviously, because, you know, she was into her 90s by that point. So we're going to have a much younger monarch who will, who will be much more sort of engaged and out there, and as we know, he's incredible at the tours that he does. But in terms of how he will... Um, Rain. I just thought the, the speech on Friday evening was utterly amazing, mm. and that he managed to take to take the whole uh, national conversation really from that point of mourning through to really being able to imagine him as our next king. And I thought the lines that he used about endeavouring to serve with, I think, loyalty, respect, and love. If you look at those words, it's, it's quite fascinating. Respect. I think mm -hmm. that's the respect that he understands how different people are now, how, how society has changed and, and the, the emphasis on the, the individual and it's, it's with respect for those and with love and I thought that was, that, I think that's the key point. Do you think that speech might have taken some of your readers a little bit by surprise? Uh, yes, 
I think perhaps it has, and but in a good way. What yeah. about can I add to that? Because Absolutely. I think there is something about we know that he cares about things. Mm -hmm. We know that he cares about uh, education. We know that he cares about the environment and the impact on the environment for future generations. We know that he cares about inequality and what is going to happen to our young people. So whilst I think that important thing about making that transition to King and being absolutely impartial, we already know mm. that he has those passions and that he will bring that empathy to the way that he is king. It was very interesting though, um, Sir Nicholas, that he also in that speech very carefully drew a line in a way under his time as Prince of Wales. He very clearly said, my charities and causes will be for someone else to take forward. Mm. His life will now be taken up with so many of those official duties, like the audiences with prime ministers. He's already had his first one with Liz Truss. How do you think he'll make that transition? Well, I think he, he'll make the transition with great ease because he knows perfectly well what the rules are. <laughs> and he's had a very long time at the feet of his mother, who after all was the most one of the greatest queens this country has ever had. Uh, he would have watched the way that she did it. And he knows exactly the constitutional proprieties. So I think that while some of the issues that Prince Charles uh, the King had, um, uh, had strong views on, like the environment, mm -hmm. are now completely mainstream. They're no longer a sort of highly contentious. I mean, you know, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh used to speak very, very... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, powerfully on the environment mm -hmm. but clearly he will never get involved in any form of political controversy. It was very interesting to just to see him with Liz, Liz Truss at that meeting and actually there was more access for mm. cameras the microphones were able to pick up some of yeah. their words so do you think actually already we're seeing a sort of evolution? I'm sure we are you know I mean it is inevitable this is a transition as Valerie said this is a real transition mm -hmm. from the old to the new and each monarch presumably makes their own role within the monarchy, but within the very strict conventions which have bound monarchs uh, for all time now. And talk about evolution and change. I mean, now the Queen Consort, Camilla, by the King's side. Alison, how do you think the public will view that? How do you think they'll see her in that role? Well, so when it was announced earlier in the year, mm. so relatively recently, that she was going to take the, the yeah, role the Queen, Queen made Col it very plain, didn't she? Yes. I mean, I think there was some concern around um, the King, um, you know, Prince of Wales as he was then, that how this might sit with the public. But actually, I think it's everybody really feels that she has been an incredible support to him um, over the last two decades um, since their marriage, and that she um, is at his side whenever he travels, and that really. I think there's been a general acceptance that things change, relationships change, and as long as he's happy and he's got the emotional support to do this, what's well, going to be an extremely difficult job, then that's okay. And part of that job, and one of the things he cares about and the Queen cared so much about, of course, is the, was the Commonwealth. Now, there is some discussion already around about how this transfer might have an effect on countries that are mulling, considering their role in the Commonwealth. We know, Baroness Amos, that Barbados has already become a republic, moves towards that in Jamaica, a little bit of chatter in Australia too about perhaps not right now but before too long knowing the diplomacy and those networks what do you think will happen well I think there are a couple of things um, one is that I think we should all remember that as Prince of Wales King Charles went to Barbados when they made that transition from the Queen being head of state to becoming a republic uh, and my sense is that he feels very, very strongly that this is a decision for the peoples of those countries and that the close relationships that we have with those countries um, as a result of a shared history and so on, that those relationships can still continue even as those countries make those decisions about who is head of state. And I think we have to be very, very careful mm. not to mix up Mm -hmm. the decisions that those countries and the people of those countries have every right to make about what our future relationship is in terms of Commonwealth countries more broadly, but also with the rest of the world. Um, you know, our uh, previous Prime Ministers talked about the important uh, role the Queen played uh, in terms of diplomacy. I think we will see the same and with King and Charles. And we'll talk about that a bit more later. It'll be interesting to see how those relationships evolve. But there are also, 
huge, other hugely important things happening in this country at the moment that we'll just briefly touch on. Alison, had this sad event not taken place, we would have been talking endlessly about a huge government intervention in the energy market to help people support, to, to help people pay their bills through the winter. We can have a look at how the Sunday Times is covering that this morning. We know that people have been desperately worried about what might the next few months might bring. Do you think the government's huge intervention will solve that? Will it be enough? Well, I, I think certainly um, this time last week, mm -hmm. um, the, that was the only thing that people were talking yeah. about. Um, I mean, obviously, perhaps £100 billion has been spent yeah. this week, yes. um, and it's barely got a line in the, uh, in the weekend's papers. But I think what we have to remember is that when this period of mourning is gone, mm -hmm. that anxiety in people's lives about how they're going to pay the bills, that will have been reduced. So, so that is there. I mean, how uh, it's being done is obviously the, the mm -hmm. point for debate. Um, that. Uh, the Prime Minister has sort of refused any form of windfall tax so we've still mm. got vast profits being made by the energy companies um, whereas actually now that this money is going to sit on a national debt which is going to have to be paid back at some point but but at least the initial anxiety has been taken away from people. And Sir Nicholas I mean as a former Conservative MP how do you feel about such a massive scale of state intervention far bigger than the furlough scheme during Covid that cost tens and tens of billions of pounds? Well I feel that it was inevitable given the circumstances. I don't think there was any other way of doing it. I think people's fears were entirely justified. The scale of this, of the gas intervention because of the war in the Russian war in Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, rendered it absolutely essential that the government step in. And I think they stepped in very boldly and a very big. I agree entirely with Alison. Of course, the big question that remains. Um, is how, you know, when this starts being paid back and we are further loading onto future generations and we'll very considerable debt and, and it will have to be repaid. So the natural Tory instinct is to not, mm. not to be so pro it, but uh, there was nothing to do. There was nothing else to do. Well, I'm sure I know, in fact, in this studio, we'll be talking about that a lot in the weeks mm. and months to come, no doubt about that. But you mentioned there, Arsene Nicholas, what has been happening in Ukraine. I mean, Baroness Amos, away from the coverage of the monarchy, Russian troops appear to have abandoned some key towns. It seems that the Ukrainians are suddenly making a lot of progress. We heard here last week from the First Lady of Ukraine that everybody was pinning their hopes on a new advance and a turning point. Mm -hmm. Do you think we might be seeing that? Well, I think we all hope so, but it, we don't know. I mean, there have been various points where we have mm. thought that you know there will be uh, some kind of peace deal done or we may be able to move forward in some kind of positive way. We're not getting any kind of sense from Russia that mm. they are at that point uh, where they want to negotiate. Um, and that's my big worry. I mean, I saw the first stage of this when I worked at the United Nations. Nations yeah. And without all of the countries that are involved wanting to come together and wanting to secure some kind of settlement, this terrible, terrible war will continue. But it is really important that the Ukrainians have made key strategic advances here. They have managed to cut off some of the supply lines to the Russian uh, forces. So this may force the Russians to rethink. And we can see some very powerful images of one of the towns that has been taken back, um, Balaklia, which is one of the places that's been liberated. And Alison, we've seen, haven't we, some amazing video of people sort of coming out of their houses, greeting the Ukrainian soldiers. I mean, do I mean you think... It, well, it, it does feel like a, a, an amazing step forward. I mean, since we saw the Russian abandonment of Kyiv sort of fairly soon after, this, is, this feels like the biggest turning point that we've had it's up in the northeast of the country there. But, but that was largely, I think, because the Russians have moved their troops further south towards mm -hmm. the Crimea. And I think whilst this is wonderful and we're all looking for sort of some green shoots in this war, we have to also be mindful that Russians are still occupying about 20% of Ukraine and this will continue to be a very long and painful and bloody war. It's still a very grave and unpredictable mm. and situation. And forget the human impact of this. Mm. I mean, I have seen this in many, many situations time and time again and it is absolutely dreadful, the impact on women, children, uh, families, it's people at the heart of this. Okay, all three of you, thank you very much for now. We'll be back with you a bit later on and we will hear too, again, from the three Prime Ministers with some of their personal memories, some very funny ones about their times with the late Queen. But David Cameron told us that the late, her late Majesty had been the world's greatest diplomat 
and we can see how her death has been marked right around the world. Here we can see the Sydney Opera House lit up in tribute, the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, the New York skyline, Ottawa in Canada, even the remarkable monument that overlooks Rio in Brazil. Many cities around the world have been specially lit in her memory. Her Majesty's diplomacy was both powerful in public, but also personal. No more so maybe than for the Kennedy family. The young American president and his wife Jackie came to meet the Queen in 1961. But after his death, Britain granted an acre of land at Runnymede, where the Magna Carta was signed to the United States as a permanent memorial to John F. Kennedy. At the ceremony was a seven-year-old Caroline Kennedy, his daughter, now the United States ambassador to Australia. I've been speaking to her about what she remembers from that unique event. I think for Americans, uh, the Queen has been a constant presence in our lives. We feel very connected uh, to, to Britain um, and of course to the royal family, having watched them uh, over so many years. And with the knowledge that our alliance goes back uh, so far and is the most um, enduring and partnership, we share values and certainly the queen embodied those values her commitment to democracy, her sense of obligation, uh, her steadfastness, her warmth. And what did she mean to you and your family with their various meetings and connections over the years? Well, my grandfather was ambassador to the court of St. James's when her father was king. And so my parents' generation, my aunts and uncles, my father um, all spent time in London before the war and studied uh, that period of British history. My father was uh, such an admirer of, of England and had so many close relationships there. And certainly um, the service in the war that the Queen performed that my father and his uh, sister and brother made them all part of the same generation. And in 1965, the Queen dedicated a memorial here in the UK to your father. You were there with your mother and your brother at the ceremony. Can you tell us a bit about what you remember? This memorial is an acre of land in, in, at Runnymede, uh, which is where the Magna Carta was signed, obviously. And, um, but I think that it really represents the foundation of democracy. Um, and so for the, for the Queen, for the, for the British people to donate that in memory of President Kennedy um, and our joint commitment to democracy, to freedom, to um, a constitutional government um, was something that was so significant, uh, so unprecedented. The British government of that day resolved to establish here a memorial to be at Runnymede for centuries to come. Presented to Her Majesty were persons closely connected with the memorial appeal. The little Kennedy children took every eye. What are your memories of the tribute? Well, I was just seven. So um, I do remember that we were taken uh, to Windsor Castle for lunch before we went to Runnymede. Uh, and it was me and my brother and my little cousins. And so I do remember that we, um, that the grownups um, had a more formal lunch, but we were able to have running races in the hallway to keep us busy um, <laughs> when we went to the formal ceremony. But certainly it was something that I was aware was incredibly meaningful to my mother, especially. And, um, and it was a very solemn sort of moment. And I think I, I, I remember it um, in a way that I don't remember kind of my father's funeral, but it was something that all my aunts and uncles I think um, deeply, deeply uh, appreciated. And do you remember, was it King Charles in the running races or Princess Anne or Andrew? Well, amazingly enough, I can't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think that all meant to your mother? Did she treasure those memories? Throughout her life, she had these very special uh, pro uh, uh, programs printed. This is uh, the one I have that was mine of, um, of the occasion, which is inscribed by my mother, um, says to Caroline who came to Runnymede when she was seven years old and it has the program and then it has all the remarks, um, including uh, 
Her Majesty's speech, um, as well as other dignitaries, both um, British and American. So I, I think it was always this, these were always the most treasured things in our house. And so, um, so it's, it was nice to be able to see them again today. And that amazing state visit, those amazingly glamorous images when your parents came to the UK in 1961, what do you think that was like for them? It was part of the trip to, to Europe, um, Paris, Vienna, where my father met Khrushchev. And then they came to, um, to London where my um, aunt and uncle were living and um, my cousin has just born, so there was a christening. So again, it was a combination of family and official uh, moments on that trip, but I think obviously the the most um, important or exciting was the um, visit to Buckingham Palace. And my mother was a great scrapbook and great archivist and collector of memory, and so she has this scrapbook of her time with my father, as well as one for each of us. And so, um, in it, the the pages are yellow and the photographs are falling out, but. Um, is, you know, this picture of them at the state uh, visit. And then um, I think they had, you know, a wonderful time. Now you've served as an ambassador to Japan and now Australia. How would you describe the Queen's role as a diplomat? Uh, she obviously was an incredibly skilled diplomat and leader and a constant presence that was able to provide continuity in terms of these issues over time. And I think people really looked to her for um, a sense of what was right and where things were headed and to sometimes uh, make more gentle the political conflicts of a, of a time. Ambassador Caroline Kennedy, thanks so much for speaking to us. A peek there in Jackie Kennedy's scrapbooks. Um, it was amazing to hear about her personal experiences, but also Baroness Amos, her focus on the Queen as a diplomat. Now, you are a diplomat. You've been in presence of her late, her late Majesty on many occasions. What difference did it make? Her experience and the things that she had seen made an enormous difference. And I certainly know, not only from my conversations with her, but my conversations with others, that she actually gave leaders around the world the confidence to do things that sometimes they thought they would not get through because they were so hard. Because she was able to give them a little gentle advice. They knew that this would not become public mm -hmm. in any way. Uh, and people listened to her. And it wasn't just heads of the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. it's heads from countries across the world. So that experience that she had that light touch, mm. that ability just to give a little nudge was extraordinarily helpful for them, but also for us in terms of the relationship between Britain and other countries. And just briefly, is, can you give us an example of something that might not have happened were it not for her involvement, that little nudge? Uh, I don't think that would be fair. Okay, well, I don't want you to divulge any confidences that you don't feel able to do, but you've given us a sense of how crucial her role sometimes was. But I think also she was a, you know, a true sort of diplomatic celebrity. I, mean, I remember uh, the G7 summit in Cornwall last year, President Macron, Angela Merkel, all these world leaders practically trampling over each other in order to be pictured next to the Queen, who made them all laugh, who put them at their ease. But Sir Nicholas, do you think King Charles will have that same kind of star I think, power. I think he will. Um, first of all, he is already in his own right an accomplished mm. diplomat. I mean, uh, the amount of traveling he's done, the people he's met, he has built relationships which, as Barry knows, these, these relationships are sometimes not possible for the government to have very closely. Mm. And there are several uh, very senior figures around the world who have a very strong personal relationship with the king, uh, and I think that will now be developed. And I think as, as our life goes on and, you know, in the years to come, mm. as we rebuild our, 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 our British um, foreign policy uh, um, after Brexit, I, I think he will have a very, very important role to play, um, bringing people together. And one thing that is absolutely unique about the king mm. is that he is the first one the first uh, Prince of Wales and the first one to ever use this astonishing convening power mm. of being able to get people together. I mean, he has that in, 
in spades. It's an extraordinary ability. People will come. They always came when he's Prince of Wales, and they will certainly come now when he's king. And Lord, just one thing to add, if I may. Diplomacy is about trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Queen had it, and King Charles has it precisely because of those relationships yeah. that you talked yeah. about. Okay, well, the people who certainly trusted Her Late Majesty and the person who will have to build a relationship of trust with the King, of course, is the Prime Minister. Um, the ceremony of the next week has been so carefully choreographed. At 10 o'clock today, the coffin of Her Late Majesty will be taken from Balmoral. And the BBC has a special programme to cover that journey. Let's show you the scene there as preparations are being made. It sounds like a real hush at the gates, piles and piles of flowers from well-wishers who've arrived there in the last couple of days. But Balmoral, a place that was so important to the Queen and the royal family, a symbol of their connection with Scotland, and a place where she spent time, not just with friends and family, but with her prime ministers over the years. David Cameron, Gordon Brown, and Theresa May have shared some of their memories of those trips and the reflections of the monarch they knew so well. Well, the first thing was it was just the most extraordinary privilege to spend an hour every week with, you know, really the world's greatest public servant, someone who's been on the throne for so long, who had so much experience, who'd met every world leader, who'd traveled to every country. Who, and I was her 12th prime minister. So as you explained why, you know, the economy wasn't growing or this bit of public service wasn't working, you thought to yourself, She's literally heard all this before. She's heard every excuse in the book. Um, but it was an immense privilege. And what you found was not only was she a great listener, but also sage counsel and advice and brilliant questions. And what you found, I, I found at the end of the hour, you'd walk out of that room. There's no one there taking notes. Mm -hmm. There's no one else with you. Um, the world's problems hadn't changed, your problems hadn't changed, but you felt you were better equipped to deal with them. It turns into a conversation. It's not a sort of debriefing. <laughs> um, it is a conversation about issues because the Queen does her homework, uh, did her homework. She would read her red boxes, she would read government papers, she would know what was going on. Uh, and of course she had tremendous experience of issues and of people. Did she ever lead you to change your mind, wittingly or unwittingly? <laughs> well, I can't reveal any particular <laughs> conversations, but I think the great thing is, yes, that, that coming from a slightly different angle, from a slightly different perspective, can make you think. I haven't, thought, haven't sort of looked at that quite as clear, closely as maybe I need to. And what's the best advice she ever gave you? Uh, well, everything you say to her and everything she says to you is obviously um, private. Um, but I think she was um, a believer that in order to make good decisions, you have to try and make sure your life is in good equilibrium, that your family are happy, that your home life is stable, that you get some sleep from time to time, that you're ready to face the next challenges. I never had any advice, and, and she wouldn't give that, but she would listen, she would ask questions, uh, she would be endlessly knowledgeable about everything happening in the Commonwealth. I was very embarrassed one day because I went in to see her at six o'clock and I didn't know that one of the Commonwealth leaders had, uh, had been uh, ousted and that a gov new government had been formed and she was telling me what was happening when I was supposed to report to her. And even on British affairs, you know, I'd been in the House of Commons all afternoon in mean, endless debates or cabinet meetings or something. And she, I think, had been watching television. She was getting uh, uh, notes from her secretaries and she actually knew better about what was happening to the country than I was. It was quite embarrassing, but it, it just showed how conscientious she was, how well up on the detail. And I think right to the last, and, and you could see that in the meeting she had with uh, Liz Truss when she became Prime Minister and Boris Johnson when she left, that she fulfilled her duties right up until the end. But she, she listened and she asked questions. And remember, famously, she asked, you know, why have these bankers got it all wrong in 2008? But she would never impose her will. And th this is the modern monarchy. And I think she set the tone for what King Charles and other monarchs will do. Did she ever change your mind? I think in, in, in the Commonwealth, yes. I mean, she, she was 
so supportive of the Commonwealth. One of her great friends, and probably the two greatest leaders at the time, were herself and Nelson, Nelson Mandela, and they had a great relationship. And I knew Mandela uh, well, and he used to tell me these stories. You know, when he talked to the Queen uh, and phoned her up from, from South Africa, you know, we would have said, Your Majesty, Ma'am, how are you? Uh, he said, uh, Hello, Elizabeth. How's the Duke? I mean, these were the words he actually used. To you, how important was it to have a monarch who was a woman in through the 20th century and into the 21st? At a time when a woman was not expected to be in a leadership role, when the husband was expected to be the dominant mm. individual, uh, and Prince Philip, of course, who could have succeeded in, in so many different types of areas of life, um, put himself one step behind and was always in support of her. I think it was hugely important. I've, I was asked a little while ago why it was that the United Kingdom had had, at that stage, two female mm -hmm. prime ministers, now a third. Um, and I said, I'm not sure what it is about the UK, except perhaps that we have had a woman on the throne for so many years. So people don't have any hang-ups about a woman being in that leadership position. It's said that part of her sense of humour was sometimes to do impersonations. I've read that sometimes she impersonated you. Did she ever do that in well, front of you? Is that uh, true? Is that scurrilous? <laughs> Never in front of me, but I think a Scottish accent's not too difficult, uh, not too difficult to do. And uh, I was with Rory Bremner last week, and he, he were, we, were, we were saying that, you know, it's so easy to impersonate a Scottish accent. So I don't know how well she did it, but I'm sure it was uh, probably making me sound dour, and uh, I don't know. Now, once, at one point, you had to apologise to the Queen um, for telling, I think it was Michael Bloomberg, who said she had powered down the phone when you told her the result of the Scottish independence referendum. What was it like having to apologise to the Queen? Um, well, it was a very upfront and very fulsome apology done very quickly at the beginning of an audience. And um, I think that's all I should say. But uh, for, from ever onwards, I've been more careful when cameras and microphones are around and um, I learnt my lesson. Did she tell you off? Um, obviously, everything said at those meetings is um, entirely private. She also, for Prime Ministers, traditionally would invite you and your families also to Balmoral. Um, and what, what was that like? She made you completely at home. And she, there was a barbecue she organised for everybody on the sat Saturday night. And she would actually drive you to this uh, barbecue, which was miles away, and you had to go through different estates, open and close gates and everything. And she was in the driving seat. She was actually at the wheel, and I was sitting next to her. Sarah was behind, behind her. And I think at that stage, it was the moderator of the Church of Scotland. So we were all in this car, and she was, she was driving. And then we arrived at this uh, small uh, place for the, for the barbecue, and there was Prince Philip, and he was doing the cooking. And she started setting the table and uh, providing the plates. I remember going for a walk with Samantha and getting completely lost and this car turns up and the Duke of Edinburgh winds down the window and goes, Prime Minister, you're completely lost, aren't you? And I had to say, yes, I was. Um, but going up from Balmoral into the, up into the moors where the Queen and Prince Philip would um, cook and make you dinner, he did the barbecue and she laid the table and I'm not making this up and <laughs> served the food and cleared the plates. Um, and. Uh, Seeing her in that very informal setting and talking about everything in, in, in life and politics and beyond, that's a sort of unforgettable memory and a huge, and a huge privilege. It was one of the, the picnics which was taking place in one of the bothies in the, uh, in the Balmoral estate and the hampers of food had come from the castle and we were all, everybody was mucking in, all the guests were mucking in with the royal family to put the food on the table and I picked up some cheese, I put it on the plate and I went to transfer it to the table and the cheese fell on the floor. So I had a split second decision. <laughs> and I picked up the cheese and I put it on the plate and I put it on the table. <laughs> and then I looked around and realised that standing there watching my every move was Her Majesty the Queen. And I looked at her and she looked at me and she just smiled. So the Queen perhaps was a believer in the 30-second rule that she... I think maybe she was, <laughs> yes. She met my sons for the first time, and they were very young at this time. And it was just after lunch, and she, we came out into the, in, into the courtyard, and uh, all her corgis came out with her. 
And suddenly the first words my children heard from the Queen talking to her corgis was, shut up. And every, they couldn't believe this amazement. And every time, of course, we upbraided them in the next few months and said, you've got to behave yourself. He said, even the Queen says, shut up. <laughs> we can say that too. Uh, and that just showed how, how human and, and, and what a wonderful person she was. And she was so keen to make uh, people feel, feel at home. And she could have acted as if she was above us, but actually she was alongside us. And I think that's what the British people feel. Now, I have to say, I've interviewed all three of those politicians quite a few times. I have never seen them, Nicholas Soames, light up like mm. that with those very personal memories. Today, of course, is a sombre day. And in a few minutes on BBC One, we'll see the beginning of the journey as the Queen's coffin leaves Balmoral. But, Sir Nicholas, finally to you, what will your abiding memory of Her Late Majesty be? Her grace, her warmth. And I'm inexpressibly proud that I had the honour to know her just a, a little bit. But you were never her aura. You were never in any doubt that you were in the presence of the sovereign. And yet she managed to maintain this extraordinary familiarity with her people and understanding of them and they of her, but without for ever one moment surrendering the mystique of monarchy. And she loved your grandfather. She Winston did love him. And he too. loved her. He loved her. He'd known her since she was a child. And he, he loved her very much indeed. He revered her. So, Nicholas Soames, thank you so much for sharing your recollections. You. I know it's a very difficult few days, actually, you. for you as a personal friend of the royal family. Thank you so much to all three of you for being with us this morning. And as our time today comes to a close, I feel perhaps you feel too that we understand now a bit more about one of the threads that ties our unwritten constitution to real life, because we've heard from three people who've lived in number 10, who've shared a bit of how the private conversations they had at the palace helped them, challenged them too, as they made the decisions that affect us all. And we've heard their hopes for how the monarchy will endure and evolve. Now, in a moment, as we've been saying, we'll take you to Balmoral, where Her Majesty's coffin will shortly start its long last journey. But from time to time here on Sunday mornings, there'll be a moment for something different, maybe something unashamedly beautiful. So this morning, we will close with music from the violinist Tamsin Whaley Cohen, who played for the Queen at the age of just eight and shared her talent with King Charles II.
Thank you to Tamsin for playing a stunning piece of music from hundreds of years ago for this A Day of History. And thank you to our guests this morning. And thank you also for you, to you for being with us. You can, as always, catch up with anything on the iPlayer, perhaps those reflections from three of the Queen's Prime Ministers that will be there too. Now, I will see you next week. But now we will join Jane Hill for coverage of Queen Elizabeth's final journey. Jane.